satisfied. Your victory ain't in yourself. Aren't you glad it don't go by your feelings? Thank God for that, man. Uh, if you haven't got one of these books, raise your hand. And then you boys will grab you a few of them. If you haven't got one of these books, raise your hand. And uh, we'll get you one of these books. And you need a handout, too. Now, we're going to start teaching. And uh, just raise your hand. You boys go get it. We're going to start teaching uh, uh, rightly dividing. And I know I was going to teach it just in Sunday school. But uh, I appreciate the, the phone calls and the interest. And uh, in order to keep you from getting lost, uh, we're just going to plow right on, right on through it and uh, help, you to, help you to understand some things in the Bible. All right? Now, we already uh, started in, the, on Sunday, in Sunday school all the way back in the back, Kevin. No, you can have one, one each, and then we'll have to get some more made up. I think we got about 75 made up and probably going to need to make a few more. But uh, everybody can have them. Now, you bring them with you when you come, and the only thing you'll have to do is put your own notebook paper in it from now on, but it's for you to take notes. Several of you uh, need to take some notes and things like that to keep this stuff straight. And there's a reason for this stuff right here. The Bible says you should be rooted and grounded in the truth. And you need to have a foundation, uh, the foundation that gives you something solid. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. Uh, Matthew chapter number 7. You need something solid. And uh, the reason that Christians nowadays uh, get messed up in tongues and healings and cults and all kind of strange doctrine uh, is because they don't rightly divide the Word of Truth. Now, I'm not talking about hyper-dividing the Bible. I'm talking about rightly dividing it. I told you on Sunday, if you're an intellectual, you'll have a tendency to, to study all the time and then not put anything into action. And you'll just become an intellectual Christian. You'll be lazy when it comes to the practical things of Christianity. Uh, and you won't have any standard of living and you won't have any uh, things that you ought to be doing for Jesus Christ. You'll just be studying all the time. And you become an intellectual stuffed shirt and you'll be full of yourself because the Bible says knowledge puffeth up. And then if you have a tendency to be lazy when it comes to studying and you don't like to read. I don't like to read, preacher. I just can't stand to read. And Well, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, which is the reason we're doing this study, because we want to be approved unto God, study to show thyself approved unto God. It means you've got to be a workman. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, so you won't be ashamed. Needeth not be ashamed. How? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, he puts the word rightly dividing in there because there are people that wrongly divide it. And uh, I'm going to teach you not only how I was taught, but how I believe the Lord would have it to be. I don't just teach you what I was taught uh, just because that's all I know. I teach it because I believe it to be the truth. Uh, there'll always be people, I've already warned you about this, there'll always be people when this thing starts that'll believe that they know how to rightly divide. And you want to be real careful because uh, every time this starts, you're going to have people that will come up to you and say, well, now I know what he said, but did you know... And the first thing you're going to start hearing is, is, well, now he's talking about the church, and the church really didn't start till Acts 9, O'Hare, or 13, Stam, or 28, Bullinger. Uh, well, you see, the church, well, you see, you've got to get Scripture with Scripture, people. The church was here before Paul was even apostle. Paul's persecuting the church in Acts chapter number five, Acts chapter number 9. He's persecuting the body of Christ. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Yeah, but you see, you have to understand, no, then these guys want to cut out all these things in the Bible because if you don't cut them out, you can't reconcile them. Uh, Bullinger goes all the way to 28 to start. Brother than Sam and O'Hare, they, they get themselves in the messes and contradict themselves because they don't do it. At least he was smart enough to go all the way to 28 to cut out a bunch of things he doesn't like to do. But the thing you've got to be careful about when you talk about the dispensations is, is when Paul says in Ephesians, the dispensation of the grace was committed unto me, you word, what he's talking about there is that this grace was given to Paul to give to you. He doesn't talk about the mystery of the church starting with him. He just simply says it was revealed to him. It doesn't mean it didn't get started before that. Why, in Acts chapter number 5, they're over there preaching to the church. In Acts chapter number 2, they're adding to the church. Say, well, there's a Jewish church and there's a Gentile church. Well, you need to read your Bible again. Acts chapter 2, you've got Jewish converts. It's predominantly Jewish. You hadn't even started with the Gentiles until Acts chapter 7. But you've got Gentiles in the church in Acts 3, 4, 5, and 6. You've got a Gentile saved in Acts chapter 8 before Paul, by grace, he's saved. Before Paul even comes around in Acts chapter number 9. And you get another one in Acts chapter number 10 before the gospel's ever preached in Acts 15. 
Now, I know a lot of this stuff I'm saying to you right now you don't understand. It's just you heady, high-minded individuals who want to derail these young Christians who don't know anything. And you've just listened to what you've been taught, but you haven't read what they have got their information from. And if you read and knew what was, where it was rooted and grounded, then you'd be in a mess. Uh, anybody of you read Calvin's theology before? I mean, really read Calvin's theology? That guy blames God. Now, I'm talking about really reading it. I'll show you the quote. God, he blames God for calling a guy, saying, Whosoever will, let him come. And then when he gets there, turning him down, saying, Well, well, I never intended for you to come anyway. He blames God. He says, God can do something immoral. Well, that's not Wesley. You know what Wesley says? Wesley says, God will never do anything wrong to get a chance to do right. Well, now that's, that's right. God's holy. He's not going to change. You ever read 1 Samuel chapter 23? 1 Samuel chapter number 23, there, these guys are going to come. David prays and says, Lord, are these guys going to get me? And the Lord said, they're going to capture you, man, and take you down big time. And they don't do it. Well, is God a liar? Numbers 23. Romans 3, let God be true, every man a liar. Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie. Well, did God lie? Well, then how come they didn't come down and get David? Because David subverted, or David uh, uh, changed the thing that happened to him because he said, well, if they're going to come down and get me, I'm going to get out of the city. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 23. God said they're going to come get you. You ever read the book of Jonah? He gives Jonah about eight words in a message there. I've got to jump right in, man, because I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm piped up for this stuff all day. The first Samuel chapter 23, should be around 10 or 11 there. Yeah, 10. Uh, you ever read the book of Jonah? If you hadn't got a book now, boys, you watch these people coming in, get them a book. If there's any more books over there, get them a book. Listen, listen, have you ever read the book of Jonah? He says to Jonah, he says, you go over there to Nineveh and you preach to them people 40 days and I'm going to destroy you. And Jonah says, okay. He never says, now tell them if they repent, I'll change my mind. He never says that. You know what God says? You tell them 40 days and judgment's coming. So Jonah preaches 40 days and that old king over there says, oh my God, man, I'm going to repent. The animals are going to repent. We're all going to fast, man. We're going to put, we're going to put on sackcloth and ashes and... and you know what Jonah does? He gets mad because he's saying, well, you told me they were gonna, that they were going to get judgment and they didn't get judgment. You know why they didn't get judgment? Because they repented. Do you know why you don't get the judgment of hell? Now think about this for just a minute, okay? Now just think. The Bible says, Yea, and uh, the, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The Bible says you're born dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible says that if you die with your sins on you, that you wind up going to hell, right? He says that that's guaranteed to you. You're going to hell. You know how you change that? You repent. You say, Lord, I don't want to go to hell. Forgive me of my sins, man. I want to go to heaven. And the Lord says, okay. But He wasn't lying when He told you you were going to hell. See, look, folks, you've got to understand something about your preacher. I'm just a dumb country boy. But I serve a God that makes sense. I serve a God that has got makes just down home country sense where a plowboy out there dealing with a hoe in his hand and sweat running down that hoe handle can sit there and, and understand something like that. Not this stuff of what? Well I am, I ain't, I don't know what. If I do, if I don't do, I, I have to work, I gotta go to church, I don't go to church, I do I have to what church do I go to? I got a Bible and a God that can reach that individual that doesn't have any intellect when it comes to to the physical or the social realm as far as scholastic in intelligence is concerned. You had not got to be intelligent to understand God. The best way to understand God is to admit you're stupid. And you know what God says? God says, buddy, compared to me, you're the dumbest thing that ever walked on two feet, but that's the wisest thing you ever said. You see, man's problem is he always wants to... You have to watch it. You've got to guard it yourself. Man always wants to interject himself into the equation. It was never about you. It's always been about Him. And if you get that thing down, man, and then realize He's letting you get in on it, on what He's doing. People say, I wish to God I was never born. Not me, man. You realize because I was born, I got a chance to be born again. And now that I've been born again, that mansion we were just singing about, and my victory in Jesus, all that kind of stuff, I get all of that because I was born physically, so now I've been born again spiritually. I'm glad I was born in spite of the trouble that we have here. 
Look in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23 just to kind of make this point for you so that you understand. You say, why? You're going to run up against it. Every time we start this stuff, there's always going to be opposition. You can't imagine the opposition that's been going on. Now watch. 1 Samuel chapter 23 verse uh, 10. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Kelial, uh, 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 come, sorry, Keilah, to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me to the, his, into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Well, did he? Then said David, Will the men of Keilah uh, uh, deliver me, uh, uh, Keilah deliver me, and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee. Well, did they? Look at verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah and went with us wherever they could go. And it was told Saul that David escaped from Keilah and he forbade to, uh, forbear to go forth. Well, God told David he was coming and he didn't come. Well, did God lie? See, it's just common sense. God said, they're coming, buddy. They're going to get you and they're going to wrap you up and they're going to they're gonna turn you guys over and you're done. You're history. And David said, well, I'm leaving then. The Lord said, okay. <laughs> See, that just makes good sense. The Lord says to you, boy, you're going to hell. And you say, uh, not by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm, not, I'm getting saved. I don't want to go to hell. Look at Matthew chapter 7. I can give you some things here that will help you to solidly root you and ground you in the Word of Truth so that you'll understand this stuff now. And uh, I gave you a little chart there. Um, I, I can't hear you. Does anybody not have a book? Oh, you mean the other the papers? So, boys, make sure everybody's got one of the papers I just gave out. One of these little charts. It's a little chart that looks like got little uh, teepees on it. Y'all got those? Just boys, y'all see if they got them. Matthew chapter number 7. We'll get this together here in a second. Matthew chapter number 7. If you don't have one of those little charts on there that will show the, the ages that are in there and it will show the fall of man and then come back up and show the fall of man and then come back up and show the fall of man, that kind of thing. Verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken them to a wise man that built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not as it founded upon the rock. Everyone that heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon the house and fell, and great was the fall of it. And the Bible says this in verse 28, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at His doctrine, as he taught, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, God, we come to you tonight and we realize the subject in which we're about to continue to discuss and to try our best to teach. We know we need the inspiration, the power of the Holy Spirit of God to help us to understand these things. And we pray, God, that you make them simple for us and understandable for us so that we'll not be blown with every wind of doctrine, so that our roots may be down deep and rooted and grounded in truth, Father, so that we'll not be swayed by the way of the world and the doctrine of the world. We pray, Father, You might bless us here with Your presence. We appreciate so much the good group of folks that are here and the desire they have to learn these things. Now bless them, Lord, and feed them from Your table, we pray Thee, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I told you on uh, Sunday morning when we were starting to study these things that if you apply situations and doctrines to yourself that are not for you doctrinally, you're going to get yourself in trouble. For instance, in the Bible, there are places where there are people that work for salvation. This is great. I feel like we're in school. Go ahead. It ain't bothering me. That's great. Click, 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 click. <laughs> in that Bible, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. In the Bible, you'll find out that the Lord is speaking to the Jew, the Gentile, or the church of God. The Jew, the Gentile, or the church of God. That's the divisions that He makes. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 32. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. 
So what you have to pay attention to is, number one, who's talking? Number two, who are they talking to? And then you have to pay attention, is it the Jew, the Gentile, or the church of God? And is he speaking to an individual or is he speaking to a nation? You have to pay attention to those things when you read the Bible. You say, why? Because the Bible, Hebrews 4.12, is the discerner of thoughts and intents of your heart. And if you're looking to propagate your own righteousness, there's a lot of verses in the Bible where you can find exactly what you're looking for. People that get messed up in the wrong doctrine, they get messed up because they simply do one thing. They apply scriptures that are in the Bible that do not fit for them doctrinally. For instance, how many of you here tonight are saved? All right, there are passages in the Bible that are written to unsaved people. For instance, unsaved people go to hell, right? All right, do those passages on people going to hell apply to you? No. You know why? You're not going there. Now, see, you just made a right division. Now, if you study and study and study and study and you start reading those verses and you don't do things according as I'm going to show you here in a minute, according to what Paul says, according to the mystery revealed to him, according to the Pauline doctrine, Romans to Philemon, you'll start reading and then you'll think, well, you know what? Uh, I believe that that passage applies to me and that I might could go to hell. So then you'll start teaching that a believer can lose his salvation and go to hell. See, there are people that can lose their salvation and go to hell into the tribulation period and in the Old Testament, but it doesn't apply to you. So then you start worrying about your eternal security and whether or not you really are, whether or not you aren't, because you're looking at one thing to justify it. You're looking at your own works. And if you look at your own works long enough, you'll realize you ain't righteous enough to get to heaven if you use the measuring stick of God's Bible. You'll realize, and you know what it'll make you do? It'll make you thankful every day you get out of that bed for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses from all sin. And you'll realize, man, thank God for the blood and thank God I'm sealed by Him and I'm not sealed by my work, not kept by my work, and that kind of thing. So you want to be careful not to apply a Scripture that is written to the Gentile. You don't apply that to the church, nor do you apply church doctrine to the Gentile. Or here's the big mess for today, which I'll show you in a moment. The big mess for today is is where we take Jewish doctrine written to the nation of Israel and apply it to the church. And that's where we get into a lot of problems about prosperity. We do have a P that comes up for us. They've got that part of their homiletical outline correct, but we're promised to get persecution, not prosperity. Paul says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But in the Old Testament, that Old Testament Jew in Israel could even have his healing in his own physical body as well as his health, as well as his wealth, as well as his prosperity, as long as he kept the law and kept the commandments. It didn't mean that he was sinless. It meant that when he sinned, he offered the sacrifice and the Lord would bless him in the physical sense. But for you, the Christian, you're not promised that. In the Old Testament, they have very little spiritual revelation about the afterlife, about uh, devilology or demonology, however you want to say that, about the things that have to do with the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and rulers of darkness and high places. But they had great revelation about physical things, which was confirmed with signs, wonders, and miracles, seeing God do things with their eyes, fleshly things, because it had to do with a literal, physical, earthly kingdom, which we'll talk about in this study, which is about the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. You are inheriting the kingdom of God, which is not meat and drink. So for us in the New Testament, Paul, as a believer, is promised certain things, but it's not physical health, it is not physical wealth, it is spiritual revelation, it is things about that are going out here in eternity, about heaven, about hell, about uh, spiritual things that he gets. And guess what? He gets it from a book. They got it from prophets. The Jews seek after a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. He gave it to you in a book. So you've got to make the right division in the Bible. And if you don't make the right division and you start applying something that is Jewish doctrine to church doctrine, you are headed for a train wreck. You'll be claiming promises that are not your promises to claim. Now listen, the whole Bible is for you. It's all given by inspiration of God and it's profitable 
But Paul says in Romans 16 that you are to take that Bible and Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And when he tells you that, he says, you better line up that Bible according to what I have had revealed to me. And you must remember this is a key thing to understanding the Bible. In the Old Testament, they did not see a church age. The prophets never saw a church existing. God had the thing set up that if they accepted Him or His Son or the Holy Spirit, He could have stepped right off in the tribulation and kept that thing secret until the end of the millennium if He'd have wanted to. But because they rejected, 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 when Israel rejected, the Lord says, I'm done with you. And to provoke you to jealousy, I'm going to take it over here to the Gentile and I'm going to call one of your own people to take it over there, a Jewish apostle. But now you better not believe what this fool on the television teaching right now that God's done with Israel. He ain't done with Israel. He'll go back to Israel after the church is gone. Don't you believe that foolishness? God's done with Israel. That's anti-Semitic. That's a setup to let you know that right at the year, you're almost at the end of the stepping off. The rapture's fixing to happen. It ain't going to be long before your own country's going to turn against Israel. And buddy, when you do, you unbuckle your seatbelt. People say, buckle your seatbelt. You're fix- uh-uh, unbuckle it. Turn loose everything you got, buddy, because we're fixing to go. Now, you've got to make sure you make right divisions. Don't be going over there to Isaiah. And, uh, if my people which are called by my name shall repent and call upon the Lord, I'll bless them. And I'll, uh-uh, buddy. That's the Jewish nation of Israel. My people are Israel. You're not, that's not you. Your kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Heaven, New Jerusalem. You get spiritual things. You get God inside you. They got a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. The kingdom of God is not the same as the kingdom of heaven. The reason they get them conflicted or mixed up is, and I'll I'll just give you an overview, I'll explain all this when we get to it, is because when Jesus Christ is on earth, both kingdoms are right there with Him. But both kingdoms are here only when the king of those kingdoms is here. When He's gone, they're not here. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, I told some folks after we got done at the hospital the other day, and uh, Brother Roger resting comfortably at his house and doing pretty good, had a good surgery yesterday, um, you can call him and check on him. But I told some folks yesterday, I said, this, this gentleman came up to me and he said, you know, God's ruling and reigning on this earth. I said, you really think God's ruling and reigning on this earth? I was talking to a couple of fellows in a waiting room. We were waiting on Roger to come out. And I said, if God was ruling and reigning on this earth, I said, you think this, this hospital would be here? You wouldn't need a cotton-picking hospital if the Lord was here. You think, this, you, think, you think God's responsible for this mess you're living in right now, this cesspool you're in? My aching back. How can you say God's on the throne, man? In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the devil's running this thing right now. Uh, you're just promised to get out of here. The Lord don't want you putting your roots down here in a place. Say, why? It belongs to the devil. You know what he wants you to do? He says, you, you'd be headed for a spiritual kingdom. So God's not running the earth right now. Your kingdom is spiritual. It's not earthly. If you get those two kingdoms messed up, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be looking for healing down here right now. Now, I mentioned that to you the other day. I mentioned that this fellow that's here in town, he has a humongous church. And he's got people that come in there, man. And he does something I could never do. He'll, he'll make a statement, and it's flat. It's preaching dry as cracker juice to me. I mean, it's just dry. He's got a little thing, and he's, he's up there talking to him, and he'll pace around, and he's just saying to me, to me personally, just a bunch of nothing. But he, but he said, and then he goes, now let's give, just right in the middle, I guess he's thinking what he's going to say. Let's give praise, you know, and, and they and they are you know, just a little smattering of applause, you know. And let's give pray, stand up and let's give pray. And until they really get going and shouting and you know and all that kind of stuff, then he's all right now. And then he'll he'll be seated, like you know. I'm thinking, why you gotta let God stir them? If God don't stir them, why are you stirring them? It's not a not a cheer, not a pep rally. But this fellow's, yeah. I don't like when you talk about people. Well, you watch the stuff. I gotta warn you. You want to watch it when anybody makes a statement like this statement. This is the statement. God has now seen fit to prove Himself through His people. All right, now look at your little chart that looks like a bunch of little teepees. I guess I should have. I'll show you why God don't do that. And then we'll get back on this other thing. You see that little, you see that little chart? Now that's all your covenants that are there. And we'll go over these later. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, and... And then you got a, I mean, that's the uh, ages there. Then I wrote up above that for you uh, the covenants, the Edemic covenant, the Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, David, Davidic, 
uh, and those kind of things are there. But notice what happens. In the age of innocence, uh, Adam comes in. He's got a perfect uh, garden and those kind of things. And he's told not to eat the tree. And he eats the tree and it ends in ruin. And God reaches in and pulls him out, makes coats of skin, pulls him back up. And you're in the age of conscience now. You know how that ends? It ends in a flood. God says, I'm sick and tired. It repents me. I even made man. And uh, their iniquities come up before me. And I'm, I'm about to throw up here. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to drown out the whole bunch of them. I'm sick of them. That's the state of man. Brings them up through Noah. Gives them a chance to get out. Noah starts. Human government begins. And it winds up over in the Tower of Babel. And God has to knock the place and level it flat and scatter everybody abroad. And then He reaches in through Abraham. Build, he's searching for a city whose builder and maker is God. And Abraham comes in and he makes all the promises. And they wind up down in Egypt with, as idolaters. And then after that goes along, then they come out over there. And Joshua comes in the land of Canaan. And then David becomes their king and so on and so forth. And everything looks absolutely wonderful. David's boy comes in, takes over the throne of Solomon. And Solomon drives them off into idol worship and apostasy. And the next thing you know, here comes Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra is the preacher and Nehemiah the prophet. And they come along there and they get the work built back up and they get the thing going again and they resurrect and restore Israel or Jerusalem over there and they get the city built and they get the gates built and they get the temple built and they get everybody cleaned out and they get purged out and boy, it's just rah, rah. It's going to beat the band and then the next thing you know, Jesus Christ come, is ushered in and they kill Him. Who's they? Well, we're the they. Well, I realize they did the physical act but we're just as accountable. I'm going to get Bridget to, when she gets painting all these things she's done painting around here, I'm going to get her to paint either a faceless man or a man uh, with uh, my face on it and have a big spike in his hand and a uh, hammer and the Jesus Christ laying out there on the cross. I'm just going to have her paint a hand. They don't know what his face actually looked like, just a bloody hand arm out there on the cross with a spike and a nail and blood going everywhere and this ghoulish looking grin turn around and look and, and it'd be me. Because you need to be reminded that it ain't the Jew and the Roman that put him on Calvary's cross. It's your sin that put him there. And if it wasn't your sin that put him there, ladies and gentlemen, then his atonement was no good for you. It's only good for the man that drove the spike in him. We killed him. He laid his life down for us. We didn't go up there and physically put him to death and our sin didn't kill him. You know what he said? No man takes my life from him. I lay it down when I'm ready to lay it down. And when he saw the amount of sin all the way out, all the way out to the millennium, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take it all on me and I'll die for it. And the price he paid, ladies and gentlemen, is a price that will keep you safe until God dies. You say, when does God die? Never. And you need to be reminded of that constantly. That you're personally accountable for that. All right, they murder Jesus Christ. The Lord steps in there at uh, Pentecost, sends the power of the Holy Spirit down there, and now you're in a thing called the church age. And guess how this thing ends? The church goes out. The church ends in apostasy. The tribulation starts and man goes down again. Second advent takes place. The battle of Armageddon takes place. Millennial kingdom comes in. Thousand years rule and reign. Jesus Christ. Glory to God. He's on earth. Everything's wonderful. Devil's loose for a little season and he still finds a pocket of people that says, man, we don't like that guy ruling over us. And if we had our way, we'd kick him off the throne. The devil says, I'll tell you what, I'll be your leader. Get your nuclear weapons and let's get going. And the next thing you know, he builds up an army over there and that's where you get the battle of Gog and Magog. It happens at the end of the millennium. It's not like this fellow on TV now that's got that woman speaking for him all the time. That's, uh, I'll think of his name just a second. But he, he's on there and he's saying Gog and Magog is Armageddon. No, it ain't. He's already got Russia moving in and Magog and all that has to do with Russia and Tubal and, and all that kind of stuff. Listen, man, he's talking about, in Ezekiel, he's talking about at the end. But you see, in the Bible, it's not chronological. The Lord twists it just to see if you'll study. It ain't Armageddon. Because that battle, the battle of Gog and Magog, you don't have to fight. You don't ride back with on no horses or nothing else. You sit there and the Lord says, Honey, come on in the city. I'll fight for you. You're my wife. I ain't letting nobody get around you. You stay home. Tend to the chilling. And he goes out there, buddy, and he destroys them with the fire that comes out of his mouth. And that thing kindles a fire that winds up exploding the whole universe. And he folds that thing up like a garment. And all them people that are down there burning right now in hell, all of a sudden, I mean, just like that, they're standing there in the midst of nowhere after burning for thousands of years. And the only thing that's between, that they can see is, is there's God right in front of them. 
And God says, it's time for judgment. And they've been burning, let's say you take somebody like maybe Cain, for instance, been burning about 5,000 years, and he's been screaming in torture. Pilate down there washing his hands in the fire to the flames of hell, and all of a sudden that fire, just like that, blows out. And they're thinking, oh, man. Man, what relief. They come up, and they're smelling like sulfur and boiled eggs, man, and stink. And they're standing up there and tormenting. And here's God saying, okay, here's your second chance. And when they get done and the Lord shows them their life up there and shows them their rejection of how they were supposed to do things when they were in that period of time, he'll say, get down there and they'll confess that he is Jesus Christ, the glory of God the Father. And an angel will grab them and cast them off. And when they go, buddy, they'll lose that bodily shape. They'll lose any recognition of who they even are. And they go right off into that thing and they splash into that lake of fire and they burn forever. It's a lot worse than just hell, man. But that thing takes place after Gog and Magog. You say, how do you got it? Why you got to get it right? You got to divide the Bible in the right places or you get your theology all twisted up. And the next thing you know, you're starting to look for Russia to be a sign for the second coming. And you start looking for the Antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. Hey, man, I'm getting raptured out. I don't care. After I'm gone, I don't give a flip what he does down here. It's his business. It don't belong to me anyway. You know what the Lord thinks of it? He's going to destroy it. The earth is clean, dissolved. That's what he thinks of it. Nothing. Just dissolves it. And those people that are right now in the heart of the earth, if you could dig a hole down here right now and bury, go down in the heart of the earth right now, you'd hear them people screaming right now. Screaming like nothing you ever heard before. Now the reason I show you that is, is you tell me, how can anybody say that has any sense at all that man is the answer to his own problem? He's always end in history and failure. How can, how can somebody say God's going to use a man to prove himself? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. Well, how is God going to use man to vindicate himself? God's not interested in vindicating himself. Where did you get that? All right, over there in the, book of, uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament, a Jew was told he could vindicate himself. But over in the New Testament, you know what you're told in the book of Romans? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay evil for evil. Go ahead and give them a gift when they mistreat you. Be nice to them. But in the Old Testament... You could pray prayers and ask God to kill those people that were bugging you and persecuting you. See, if you don't get the Bible right, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be praying God kill all these people and God get rid of all these people and God do these things and you're going to be praying a real prayer. You've got to get the Bible right. You've got to get the right divisions. That's important. All right, he speaks to Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. And that's where the problem gets started when it comes to, uh, to this thing about tongues and signs, which I'll show you in a minute. Look in Exodus chapter number 15. The Old Testament Jew had very little understanding of spiritual things, about life hereafter and about heaven and that kind of stuff. Very little spiritual revelation compared to you and I, given an abundance of physical revelation. The Old Testament Jew, uh, just a little bit of spiritual revelation, mostly physical blessings, based upon his works. Based upon his works. Exodus chapter 15. All right, now how many of you have heard... Uh, these people that are saying, and this particular individual that I told you about Sunday, he's saying that the way God's going to manifest Himself through His people is, is that they're going to be given the gift of healing. And he quoted this passage. Anybody ever heard people being healed in this age? Or God's going to use man to heal men in this age? You know what God, you never heard that? Well, sure you have. They have healing lines all the time. Anoint you with oil and all that other kind of stuff. But do you know what the context of James chapter 5 is? You really want to get down to what it really is? You're confessing your faults, buddy. You're sitting down with some elders of the church and before they put any oil on you or pray over you or nothing like that, you're sitting down there and saying, uh, you're telling them guys things only God knows about you. The last time you saw that at a healing service. You're saying, man, it's not a sin. It's just something I struggle with, buddy. i got a fault in this area. Temper, lust, envy, covetousness. Elders in the church have certain qualifications too. Got quiet there. 
healing ministry. You know what God does today? Brother Roger, I prayed for him. I've been praying for him for a long time. Some of you other brothers have been praying for him for, for a long time. You know how God healed him yesterday? He put a stent in his heart. So God can't heal? He did heal. He gave man the technology to be able to put a straw in there and make the thing open up. And now the blood's flowing like it's supposed to and give him medicine to keep his blood thin. Say, well, you know, preacher, I just believe God can heal. I believe God can heal, but I believe God uses man to heal, but not in the sense of call, come up here and let me put my paws on you and I'll heal you. Go ahead and get some kind of a disease and don't go see a doctor, okay? You, you really believe that? All these donkeys, Catherine Kuhlman. Have you ever heard of Catherine Kuhlman? She was a big time healer. Where Benny, uh, Benny Hinn learned all that kind of stuff. Why does Benny Hinn want money to build a hospital for? I don't understand that. People don't think. This guy's going to build Oral Roberts. Give me $9 million or this 900-foot Jesus is going to kill me. And, and people sent money into him. Why is he building a hospital? Catherine Kuhlman, she got sick. Uh, um, I think it was breast cancer. She got sick. She went to the hospital. For what? You can't even heal yourself? You're not rightly dividing the Bible. You're not rightly dividing the Bible. This thing's conditional on what Israel did. Look at it. Exodus chapter 15. Some of you think I'm being blasphemous. I'm not being blasphemous. I believe God can heal. But I don't believe He does it like He did for that Old Testament Jew. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to show you an apostle here in just a minute, that God may want you to stay sick to give you the grace to help you to get through that sickness so you can minister to other people. He might want you to be sick, not because of sin, but because you can minister to other people because you're sick. He may not want you well. How about that? See, that's fine unless it's, bless you, that's fine unless it's, unless it's you that he puts it on. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. He only quotes the last little part of this thing. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Okay, well, that's good, but let's get the context of the passages. He's talking about uh, uh, the ordinances and stuff and then proving them in verse 25. And he said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and wilt do that which is right in His sight and will give ear to His commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. There's no prayer on their part, no faith on their part, no laying on of hands on their part, no anointing with oil on their part. All it is is, is if you keep the commandments, if you keep my words, if you do what I told you to do, then I'll make you well. I'll heal you. You won't have any of the plagues on you that the Egyptians had on them. That's a promise to Israel. That's not to you. You can claim that all day long. All right? How long do you think you can keep the commandments? Because part of their commandments was offering a bull or a ram or a turtle dove or a pigeon or any number of other sacrifices, bloodshed by a priest. In the Old Testament, they had only one place to worship. They had to go to the temple. In the New Testament, you can worship at your house. You say, why? Because your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You're the priesthood of believers. You don't have to go sit and listen behind somebody sitting behind a box and pull a curtain over there. And uh, my grandkid was the other day. We were sitting at the table, and she came over. She said, "Papa, I want to tell you something." And I said, "Okay." And she goes, "Well, I, I kind of need to talk to you, you know." And I said, "Oh, I, I get it." And I took out a napkin and I held it up, you know, between me and her. And I said, "Go ahead." She said, "Bless me, Father." <laughs> I know some of y'all don't think that's funny, man. But she, then she said, I can't imagine doing something like that, you know. And I realize they're just as wicked as your kids. I, I know that. I thought that was cute, though. A little bit of it sticking with her. And then she sat down there and she started, I said, listen, before you go any further, honey, just tell Jesus. Just tell Jesus. Just learn to confess your sin to Jesus Christ. Just tell him to put it under the blood, Okay. Man, quit carrying all that guilt. You messed up. Fess up, man, and go on. But listen, in the Old Testament, man, you had to come up there and take that little lamb or take that ram or take that thing and go up there and say, Priest, I need you to offer something for me. I can't offer it myself. And you got to go through all this ritual and stop by the altar and the labor. And then you could only go so far. And then the priest would take it the rest of the way for you. Well, buddy, now I can enter in boldly to the throne room of Jesus Christ and make my request known unto Him. And I'm going to be honest with you as your pastor, the most frequent request I make to Him is, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. 
you say, why, 1 Corinthians 11, if you'll judge yourself, you should not be judged. Well, buddy, when I judge myself, you know what I find out? I'm filthy. You know what that Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11? Written to a, given to a church. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians 11? He says, for this cause, not judging yourself, many are weak and many are sickly and many sleep. So I just figure I just keep judging myself, man, just constantly. And buddy, when I do that, man, the Lord rings my bell. And the next thing you know, man, I'm in there. I'm, I'm thinking, I, I can't get over it. Why would God let me come in there after what I've done and talk to him and wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ and say, how you doing? Welcome home. I don't, man, I don't see how you can just not just, every day you think about that, how you can just not shout. There's such liberty in that. Every time I've ever done that. Brother David, you may not have, but ain't it strange? Every time you go up there to the Lord, he ain't one time, not one time, Brother Larry, not once has he ever said, get out. I don't want to talk to you. But I come in there by the Spirit, and he says, how you doing? I'm not doing so good. Larry, I can see that. Oh, I want to come home. And he says, well, I've been late. Welcome home. I like that, man. That's not your excuse to sin. But it sure is a comfort to know when you do that he don't say, all right, Exodus. Now, now write it down if you're taking notes. Exodus 15, 26. It's a conditional promise based upon Israel doing right. Doing what the Lord says. Doing that which is right in His sight. Keeping His commandments and keeping all of His statutes. Well, you can't keep them all. Look in Deuteronomy. So what they had to do was constantly offer a sacrifice. Look in Deuteronomy. <coughs> Excuse me. Deuteronomy uh, 28. Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Um, Michael, here, give me. Uh, there's just some bottles right back there. So if you're in my office, you get some. <laughs> <coughs> Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his. What? Do you have to keep commandments? No. Do you have to keep commandments? It's good if you do keep them, but you don't get a promise if you keep them or don't. Watch. Which I command thee this day, the Lord thy God will set thee high above all nations on the earth. Nations. Talking to a nation. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Conditional. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field. Notice verse 5. Blessed shall thy basket and thy store be. Material comfort. Verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Unfailing protection. The Lord, verse 8, shall command blessings upon thee, upon the storehouse and in all that settest thy hand to. Prosper your work. Verse 9, The Lord give you the land. Verse 8, I'm sorry. Verse number 8, He'll give you the land. Verse number 9, The Lord establish the holy people unto thyself. Here's the condition. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. Verse 10, Here's your testimony. All the people of the earth shall see and thou... Thou art called by the name of the Lord. He'll protect your testimony. You'll have an abundant supply. Here's a promised reward. Verse 12. The Lord shall open unto thee His good treasure to the heaven to give rain physical unto the land in His season and bless all the work of thine hand. Physical. Verse 13. The Lord shall make thee the head, not the tail. He'll give you a special place of honor. You say, why? Because that's a physical blessing to Israel if they keep the commandments, not to you. Now, let's compare that with Paul. Scripture with Scripture. Let's go from Old Testament to New Testament. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now, is this helping you rightly divide the Bible? Helping you to understand some things? Helping you to realize that, boy, if you can get this stuff down, that Bible's not hard. Boy, it'll just help you and you'll, be, you'll just rejoice. You'll read that Bible and all of a sudden you'll hit a passage that will look like works for salvation. You know what you'll do? You'll go, I might not know where that fits, but I just know it don't fit on me. It's like me trying to put on a size 9 pair of shoes. You can forget that. I can't hardly get my toe in a size 9. So you know what I do? I know that shoe fits somebody, but if I'm stumbling around the middle of the night, uh, we're over there in Romania, and, and uh, it, the lights don't come on until a certain time of the morning and all this stuff, and, and you, they got a furnace over there, and it goes out by the morning time, and it's freezing, stinking cold, and there's an outhouse that you got to go to that the pigs are over behind. 
that you got to go out to. And, and so you get up in the morning and you're stumbling around there. And we didn't bring flashlights. So you got to try to find a match to light a candle. Well, if, not trying to be crude, but if you've got to go, man, I mean, you, you ain't looking for a match and light a candle. And, but you don't want to walk out in that freezing cold snow out there barefooted. So I'm stumbling around and I'm trying to find my shoes to get my shoes on. And there's this other little fellow that's there with us. His name's Daniel. He's the, one of the missionaries over there and he's a national. That boy ain't got feet big as a woman's feet, man. I mean, like this. And I'm, I've, I'm trying to get, you know, and I'm trying to find, I'm like, man, that, that can't, this can't be my shoes. And I'm trying to get them things on. And finally, I got them on just the tips of my toes. And I'm out there walking, you know, like this. But you know what? As silly as the illustration is, that's what a lot of Christians try to do. They read something in the Bible and they try to put on something that don't fit them. And then they can't move around, they can't do anything, and they look like an idiot when they're out there trying because they're wearing something that they're not supposed to wear. And man, once you get on the right size shoes, it gives you protection from that cold, hard surface and keeps you from getting your feet dirty too while you're going to that place out there. Listen, folks, you got to wear the stuff that God wants you to wear, and there's plenty. Don't be wearing something that somebody else is to wear. Don't wear passages that have to do with unsaved people on you. You're saved. Don't wear passages that have to do with you going to hell. You're not going. You're sealed. You don't have to worry about that. So don't put them on. Read them. Oh, man. Oh, my God. This guy lost it. Yeah, thank God it wasn't me. That's a good shouting ground right there. So I don't understand. All I have to shout about is, is I don't have to worry about losing it. I don't have to understand everything else except I know I, didn't, I don't have to worry about losing it. So I'll shout about that. Poor fellow lost it. You understand all of those kind of things? I didn't for a long time. I just knew I couldn't lose it. Don't you let somebody twist you up and tie you up in that kind of foolishness, man. The same thing happens when it comes to... Well, I'll get to it in a minute here. God willing. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Here's Paul, verse 5. For such a one I will I grow, yet myself I will not glory, but in mine what? Infirmities. Verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which seeth me to be, at, for he that heareth me. Now what does he say? For lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there's given me a thorn in the flesh. Paul says right there that I'm living a godly life, a clean life. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Leave your finger right there. Let me show you this. Paul's a Jew, and according to what you just read in the book of Exodus and the book of Deuteronomy, if a Jew kept the law and was blameless before God because of the sacrifices and did that which God commanded him to do, what did you read? God to bless him and God to keep him healthy, didn't he? He's got an infirmity. And Paul's living a clean life. And he's living a just life. And he's living a righteous life. Philippians chapter 3. I think I said 2. Philippians chapter 3. Verse number 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh me uh, that he hath otherwise, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Benjamin, of the tribe of Benjamin, of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Well, why is he sick? Because Paul is under a different dispensation. He's in the church. He's not in Israel. So the church age doctrine applies to him, not the Israel, uh, the doctrine to Israel. And so his promise is spiritual revelation, not physical blessing. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7. Notice he gets a revelation, an abundance of revelation. You see it? You've got to get those things together. You know why? Because if you don't, you're going to get yourself in a mess. The preacher I've always been taught, we're going to run into that a lot. The preacher I've just always believed, we're going to run into that a lot. You're going to have to make a decision that you're going to look at what the Bible says and at least consider, at least consider what it is I'm teaching you. And pray about it and let the Lord teach you. And if you don't agree with it, that's fine. That's your, you got free, you choose whatever you want to choose. That's fine. But don't be so cotton picking stubborn that you just stick on how you've always believed 
It's like the churches I used to be in in the mountains, and you go up there to preach, and, and buddy, and it's like, bless me if you can. Their favorite song is, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I mean, buddy, they ain't going to be moved. You couldn't move them with that slack, man. I mean, they're just, they'll just look at you. And if you preach something, buddy, that's right out of that Bible, that grandpa or grandpa or whatever thought and said or whatever, they're like, that ain't true. That ain't what Granny said. Well, but this is what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible says. That ain't what Granny said. Personal experience. People stubborn about that. Well, God, you know what God will do? Blow the light out. See you later. He won't. He won't argue with you. He, he ain't going. The funniest thing about the Lord to me is, is that He's right all the time, but He won't argue with you. You know what He'll let you do? He'll let you say, "I just don't want to believe that." He'll say, "Okay." See you later. I'm not arguing with you. You say, why? I'm not going to validate your argument toward me like it's worth even responding to. I'll apply Romans chapter 12 and just go ahead and I'm not going to let you be my judge. I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer such a foolish question. And the Lord will just let you run right off in a ditch. Save people, born again, and watch you just crash right off in the ditch. Just rot down there in the bottom of the hole, down there drowning in the river, and nobody to come in to get you out. Windows rolled up, water starting to come up, bubbles going on. He knows he's up there. But I just think, but I just think, the Lord will see you later. Be fish food before long. All right, look in First Corinthians chapter number one. Now that boy right there uh, is an apostle to the Gentiles, and I, I've given you those scriptures before. And if you don't have them, I'll write them down for you. But here he is, an apostle to the Gentiles. And you know what he says? He says, I'm not promised anything, but yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I get no prosperity, I get persecution. My promises are not for a little physical earthly kingdom. My promises are for a spiritual kingdom. My promises are, are my revelation has nothing to do with the things that I see on earth. My promises have to do with things I see that are eternal, spiritual things. Why wasn't, if, if healing is for you today, why wasn't Paul, the, our pattern, the apostle to the Gentiles, why wasn't Paul healed up? Because he was doing what they said in the book of Exodus to the letter, above the law, blameless, because he's in a different time period. And God's dealing with him in the church, not in the nation of Israel. And if you gave me the choice, I'd pick the church. You say, why? Because I'm saved by grace through faith plus nothing. I wouldn't want to have to keep the law. I can't even keep the commandments of Christ. First Corinthians chapter number, what did I say? One? All right, now, every, every place in the Bible, now you're going to have to get this, and I have to deal with this. Uh, every, every place in the Bible where you see signs, wonders, and miracles show up, every place, tongues, healings, uh, all the things in Mark chapter 16, there's always an apostle there or someone an apostle laid their hands on, or a convert of the apostle. And there's always an unbelieving Jew present. You say, I happen to know that there's a Gentile in the Bible that speaks in tongues. You're right. Cornelius is the one that spoke in tongues, and he was a convert of Peter, and Peter was the unbelieving Jew because he didn't believe that the Holy Spirit had been given over to the Gentiles. He knew that the Lord had told him, Matthew chapter 10, I'm only supposed to go to the house of Israel and I'm not supposed to go to that Gentile dog over there. And so he goes over there and that Gentile over there speaks in tongues and shows him, I got it, buddy. You know what tongues he speaks in? Something Peter could understand. Tongues is a language. Acts chapter number 2. Every time that got that thing, people misquote that. They're saying everybody's speaking in tongues. No, are not all these which speak Galileans? They're apostles. The apostles, Acts chapter number two, verse number forty-three. Those things uh, are done by an apostle. The signs of an apostle. Look in First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-two. For the Jews require what, and the Greeks seek after what. Your wisdom comes in a book, not in something earthly. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, 22. Uh, Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not. Preacher, why do you bring this up? Mark chapter 16. I'll tell you why I bring it up. Because the world is full of this stuff today because they're not rightly dividing the Bible. And Christians now are starting to fall for it. 
A lady told me not long ago, she said, but preacher, I saw it with my own eyes. Sure, Judas worked miracles. He could raise the dead and heal the sick and cleanse the leopard and, and uh, do all those other kind of things. But he was a devil. you got to go by the Bible, not what you see. The Bible says in the tribulation that the power of the devil is so great to, to mystify and deceive that if the Lord didn't come back, even those that were his chosen, the very elect would be deceived. He looks so much like Christ. And you think you're, you're wiser than them? Come on, man. You better stick with the book. Don't go by your eyes. They'll fool you. They'll fool you. Tell me they don't fool you. You know, run, run through a light, you know, <whistles> pull you over, you know, stop. And the policeman say, you know why I stopped you? No, the light was green. And the policeman says, it's green my foot, man. We got you on camera. The thing was red. Look green to me. Tell me your eyes won't fool you. They fool you all the time, don't they? You're running down the road. You're running lickety-split, man, 75 miles an hour in a 55-mile-an-hour zone. You know how fast you're running? Oh, about 60, I believe. Like, well, the radar right here is, you know. Oh, well, I, I didn't see that. Tell me your eyes won't fool you. Especially when it's self-serving. Doesn't it? Amen. Come on, man. You think I'm kidding you? You, you, your wife gets a checkbook, man, and she gets out there and <laughs> writes out a check. Well, honey, I, I didn't know that that was only all the balance we had left. <laughs> Got fooled, you know. I thought those numbers meant more than they did. You know, I didn't know that that point thirty eight meant thirty eight cents, not. <laughs> a girl told me one time. She says, "I, I figured that as long as you had checks, you had money. You just write till you run out of checks." <laughs> That wasn't my wife. Thank God for that. <laughs> look at Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, look at verse um, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues, take up serpents, and drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Well, buddy, if you're a real apostle, as you claim to be, the Bible doesn't say that when you lay your hands on them, that they might recover if they have enough faith and if they really believe. The Bible says you put your cotton picking paws if you're an apostle on somebody, they get well. So all these people that claim to have this apostolic power, how come this brother called me today? I was excited about preaching and stuff and there's some things I was going to get the chance to teach again and that kind of thing. And he said, well, preacher, I don't think you need to teach this stuff. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, it was about 3.30 this morning. I got up and so I was looking for something to... Uh, listen, I'd find some preaching on TV. And he said, I found an answer. I looked at the History Channel, and I found they, they've got the answer now to all of the miracles in the Bible that have been explained. I said, you're kidding, brother, really? And he said, honest, preacher, they have. He said, every miracle in the Old Testament took place, the parting of the Red Sea and Christ on Calvary's cross, uh, all the things that took place, the plagues and all that stuff, Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, the whole thing was UFOs. And all the angels in the Old Testament were aliens. It was on the History Channel. That's what he said. I said, come on, brother. You're watching a cartoon or something. He said, preacher, I'm telling you, honest God truth. And they had preachers on there verifying it and saying that's probably true. So they have a little spaceship over the Red Sea and it sends down a light ray or something and splits the Red Sea. And Sodom and Gomorrah, they were sick and tired of seeing what was going on there, so they just nuked them. Yeah, buddy, and when the rapture takes place, you know what they're going to think? Yeah, the aliens got them. It ain't so far-fetched. Let them believe what they want to believe. I know Jesus got me, and he'll straighten it out later on down the line. I don't care. It don't make no difference if they believe. That bunch of idiots is gone. I'm glad they're gone. Good. Goodbye. Good riddance. See you later. I'll be glad to say goodbye to this cesspool, buddy. This is the only clean place i got, man. The cleanest of my home, man. Some of y'all's homes. I, 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 it's clean to me. I don't that world out there, you have the whole kit and caboodle. All right, now how do you explain these kind of things? You've got to have, look who's there. Verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto who? Thank you. The eleven. And sat at meat and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now notice. These signs shall follow them that believe. So you can't have unbelief and have the signs. Ladies and gentlemen, this is before Pauline Revelation. This is before the apostle of the Gentiles. You're still Jewish. 
this isn't for you. You're not an apostle. Acts chapter 2. Let's run these real quick. Verse 43. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. If, if you just read your Bible, 90% of the heresies come out of Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. Acts chapter number 2, verse 43. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done. Thank you, Brother Gene. By who? Must be a misprint. Acts chapter number 2. Look at verse uh, 7. Verse 6, Now when there was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? You say, Are you believe in tongues? Sure, man. The apostles spoke in tongues so the people could hear the gospel in their language. You say, What was the gospel? It was still the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, Acts chapter 2, Repent and be baptized. You say, Why? Because Paul hadn't even heard the cotton-picking mystery of the gospel of the church yet. No Jesus Christ has been crucified and buried and rose again the third day. They're still preaching what Christ told them to preach before He died. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse... Um, well, just look in verses, you can just get the context. Verses 1 to 11, notice verse 1. And Peter and John went together to the temple, and the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. There's a lame man that's there, and he leaps up there in verse number 8. And so he gets life after his leaping, and, and he's led to convert. I mean, there's a lot of L's there. But anyway, he's there uh, in verse number 8. He's, he's lifted up in verse 7. He's leaping up in verse number 8. And he's leaping in uh, verse, uh, verse number 9 right there. So here's the bottom line. You have two apostles that are doing the healing. It's always connected with an apostle or an unbelieving Jew. Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, look at verse 12. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the, what? Apostles were many signs, wonders, wrought to the, among the people, and they were of one accord in Solomon's porch. It's still Jewish. Acts chapter number 10, I've already given you that thing. Acts chapter number 10, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, in uh, Acts chapter number 10, Peter's there, Cornelius gets saved, and when Cornelius gets saved in Acts chapter number 10, he speaks in tongues that Peter can understand, and he, Peter then knows that the Gentiles are now fixing to get the gospel. And by Acts chapter number 15, Paul's rebuking Peter and saying, Peter, stop preaching the gospel of the kingdom because now the Lord has showed me that we're fixing to preach the death, burial, and the resurrection and Peter says to the fellows that are standing there that are all in an uproar, Peter says, we believe as he does. And Peter fades off of the scene, and up comes Paul. Transitional. Transitional. And now the thing begins to change. But in Acts chapter 19, Paul runs into a couple of guys that have got John's baptism. John chapter 1. You remember what John's baptism is for? It's for repentance, but it's to reveal the Messiah. It's written right in John chapter number 1. They didn't know who it was. John baptized them. They came up and said, that's the Messiah. That's him right there. That's what John's purpose of his baptism, baptism was. It wasn't even the same thing, the baptism of the gospel of the kingdom. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. We don't baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. We don't baptize for salvation. We baptize as a type or a figure to show a pattern of what happened to us on the inside, buried with Christ, raised again in newness of life. Outward testimony of an inward action. We don't baptize for salvation. All that water does is get you wet. There's no transference. Paul says, so you've only had John's baptism? They said, yes, sir. He said, well, have you got the Holy Spirit? He said, Holy Spirit? What do you mean Holy Spirit? I have no Holy Spirit. John doesn't say to them when he baptizes, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. He's just baptizing in repentance for Israel to reveal the Messiah. They're baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ, the apostles. It's different. We, 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 uh, we uh, baptize here. We don't baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, they're all three and one, one and three. Yeah, but I want to make sure there's a distinction because our baptism isn't for salvation. So they baptize it. Uh, Paul runs into these fellows in Acts chapter number 19. 
Uh, have you received the Holy Spirit? He said, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. We, we've never even so much as heard, he said. We haven't even heard of the Holy Ghost. What do you mean receive the Holy Ghost? We've got John's baptism. We were baptized before Peter's even baptizing, man. What are you talking about? We don't know what you're talking about. And Paul says, come here. And he puts his hands on him. He says, Lord, I pray you give these boys the Holy Ghost to God. And has a little prayer for him right there. And right there, buddy, it's infused to him. They didn't get it automatically. They had their hands laid on them. Well, not careful. You'll be thinking that somebody transfers the Holy Ghost to you. You've got to have somebody touch you because you have to have an apostolic succession. Now you've got a mess. See how the thing works? See that thing I put you a chart in there that will show you that the body of Christ begins in Acts chapter 2. I'll not argue with you over it, but the body of Christ begins in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit's given and But people don't even know that thing. They don't even know that the ordinances and stuff are done away with, even though they're done away in Matthew 27 on Calvary's cross. They don't even know it until Acts chapter 3. But they don't know about the gospel, the grace of God, until Acts chapter number 9. It's not even preached until Acts chapter 8, and Philip don't even know what he's preaching. You just happen to know because you know the gospel. It's not preached as the gospel until Acts chapter 15. But folks, it doesn't have to be revealed to you for it to have already been occurring. So we couldn't see it taking place, so therefore it what? What? Where did you get that? You've been reading too much bullet for that. That's baloney. It, it already took place. Death of the testator, Matthew 27. There's the way. But they don't know it till later on. You say, why? Paul's got to get it. The Lord shows them, but the thing's already started. You say, how do you know? Haven't you read the passage over there where Paul says that these were apostles and were in Christ before, I, before me? They were in the church before me? How could they be in the church before him if the church begins with him? Then you're going to make Paul the pillar of the church. You're not thinking. Is Peter the church? Upon this rock I'll build my church? No. Well, neither is Paul. That thing's based on Jesus Christ. Careful, you're taking His glory. All because you're just trying to, some little pet thing, you're trying to cut out of the way, and so you, so it doesn't begin to, no, it's just that the Lord finally revealed it to Paul, but it had already been taking place. You ever read Acts chapter 2? And the Lord added to the church daily. How could He? Paul hadn't even got the revelation about the church yet. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Church, body of Christ. Paul's not hitting Jesus Christ and poking Jesus Christ and jabbing Jesus Christ with a spear. He's persecuting the church. Ain't he? Well, how could he if the church wasn't there and doesn't begin until Paul? See, it just makes perfect sense. You just have to think a little. Good night, man. Slow as I am. If I can figure it out, you can get it. Watch this now. 2 Corinthians. Is that where we were at? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Give me just a couple, just a couple more things and we'll line this up, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Truly, the signs of what? An apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. All right, when this thing comes up, the signs begin to take place. And because at the beginning, early part of the church, the church is predominantly Jewish. Signs are for the Jew. And it's predominantly Jewish. And Jewish apostles are there. Now you're beginning to make a transition to the point that Paul starts going to the Gentiles. And so one of the reasons we don't need signs, wonders, and miracles today, one of the main reasons is, is because our ministry as a church is predominantly to Gentiles, not to Jews. We're going to the world. We're not going to the nation of Israel anymore. So we don't need signs anymore. The second thing is, is the Bible says that they use signs, wonders, and miracles to confirm the Word. You say, why? They didn't have a written Bible. And so when they would do something, that you'd say, well, I'm from the show me state. I'm from Israel, buddy. You've got to show me. I've got to see it with my own eyes. And the apostles would heal the sick and raise the dead and do those kind of things right there. And then they'd say, well, then that must be the right stuff. What you're teaching must be right because it's confirmed with a sign. And we know Exodus chapter 4, when the signs first show up with Moses going over there to deliver the nation of Israel, law first mentioned that signs are for Israel, so that must be for us. But now we're moving to the Gentile. And as you move to the Gentile, you've got a completed revelation in a Bible. And you're a Greek, you're a Gentile, and you get it from the wisdom of a book. You don't get it from signs, wonders, and miracles. You don't need signs, wonders, and miracles. Don't be lazy. You've got to study. 
So you want to realize you want to realize now the passage in the Bible it says you know so when uh, that which is perfect is come then that which is in part will be done away with. You ever heard that? They're saying that means that tongues will be done away with. That has nothing to do with tongues whatsoever. But when that which is perfect is come, it's talking about the second coming of Christ. It's not talking about your Bible. I believe tongues are done away with until the tribulation. 144,000 male virgin Jews, they'll be speaking in tongues and they'll be going to every nation out here and they'll be fulfilling Matthew chapter 28 and they'll be filling Mark chapter 16 and they'll be going to all the nations and they'll be preaching and they'll be teaching and speaking in all kinds of tongues. I believe it's done away, but I'm not going to pervert the Bible to just try to prove that tongues are, are, are uh, done away with. That which is perfect is done. I believe the Bible is perfect, but the perfect in the passage is the second coming of Christ, not the Bible. Tongues are done away with because he's done right now with the nation of Israel until the tribulation period. And you want to make sure you get that. Make sure you don't misunderstand that. Otherwise, you're going to believe all this stuff. The majority of the stuff you're seeing on TV now is driven by signs, wonders, and miracles. And when you start doing that, now I'm going to show you where it'll go. You start off with signs, wonders, and miracles, and you start looking at the promises to Israel, prosperity, health and wealth and those kind of things. And then you start looking at loss of salvation, and then you start looking at being in the nation and being in national Israel. You realize, man, you can read the book of Ephesians and fi- or the book of Hebrew, shoot, the book of First Peter. I'll get it right in a minute. Do you realize that Paul's still alive when Peter's writing First Peter? And that you're called the holy nation over there in the book of First Peter? You can't cut that thing out. But if you go to First Peter chapter 1, look in verses 2, 10, 13, 15, 18, Second Peter, oh, 4, probably 7, and chapter 4, a couple of verses there. They're not Pauline at all. But a large portion of that book has still got things in there for the church. Just because it's past Philemon don't mean you can't get something out of it. Well, that's where your priesthood of believers is. But you know what you do? You make sure that thing lines up. That's like reading 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. You're in a transitional phase there. That's like reading 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. There's some great stuff in there for the church, but buddy, you better balance that thing out with Paul on Revelation because you got some stuff in there for the tribulation period. You say, what? It's transitional. It's not solidly fixed like Romans to Philemon. All right, now here's your rule that you want to go by. Obedience on the part of Israel to the Jew according to the law and the commandments and statutes plus the signs given to help them obey brought in a literal, physical, earthly blessings and the promise of a future, literal, physical, earthly kingdom. That's Israel. For you, if a person's obedient to the gospel and the revelation that he's given the things you're taught about, the life hereafter and things uh, that, are, that are here to come, the eschatological things, oh, that's a big word for future events that take place, prophecy, heaven, hell, judgment seat of Christ, a body like Christ, millennial reign of Christ, all the stuff out there. If you're given spiritual blessings, heavenly rewards, and a heavenly kingdom, and you're given a promise of much persecution, you're promised a spiritual kingdom, they're promised an earthly kingdom. And when we get together Sunday, I'll try to give you a thumbnail sketch of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and then I'm going to show you in the Old Testament when those people are saved, they don't go to heaven in spite of what Schofield says. If you've got one of those Schofield books, you've got to be careful. Schofield says, well, it doesn't mean that the Jew in the Old Testament didn't go to heaven. He didn't. He went to Abraham's bosom. He didn't go to heaven. Won't go to heaven in the tribulation. See, where'd he go? Abraham's bosom. You say, well, that's the same thing as paradise. No, it's not. It's not spelled the same. I know that sounds silly, but I mean, I'm, I mean, when I first started studying it, it's like, well, if it was heaven, why didn't he say heaven? He says heaven when he means heaven. So why did he, when he says paradise, when he says Abraham's bosom, if that's heaven, why didn't he say that? That was our first clue. But I had always been taught, always been told, everybody, you know, in the Old Testament, they look forward to the cross. When they die, they go to heaven. You know, well, they didn't. They can't go to heaven until the blood atonement's made. They're down there. And I'm going to show you, and you've all seen it before, but I'll give you a little chart. When Jesus Christ died, he didn't ascend to heaven. He went down. Heart of the earth first. 
Some of you, I know, uh, some of you are like, that's right, Peter, that's good, that's right. Some of you are like, heresy, heresy. Think about this. He comes up, third day, right? Mary comes out there outside. Listen, don't be intimidated by this stuff and by these head bobbers in here. They make bobbleheads all the time. That don't mean nothing. If you hadn't heard this stuff before, you just don't worry about these people that think they, you know, they got it down. The Lord will kick them in the slaps. You just listen, listen. Here, here's, here's the Lord. He comes up from the grave, and Mary's there weeping, and she thinks he's the gardener, and then realizes she sees he says, Mary, and buddy, she recognizes her voice. She says, Master, Rabboni, and she reaches over there to grab him, and he says, Whoa, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Well, where have you been for three days? Well, Matthew 12, verse 40, as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. I've been down there rejoicing with the folks down in Abraham's bosom. I told the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, the thief on the cross wasn't, he wasn't Jewish. He didn't go to Abraham's bosom. He went to paradise. He didn't say, today thou shalt be with me in Abraham's bosom. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, why did he say that? In Luke chapter 15, you've got the rich man of Lazarus, and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. Lazarus is a Jew. Jew or Gentile didn't go. Where did Adam go? He's not Jewish. He said, everybody's Jewish back to Adam. No, they weren't. Jews weren't around until Abraham, man. He was a Gentile to start with, Abram. And then the Lord said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start a nation with you, and we're not going to like Ham anymore. We're going to call you Abraham. <laughs> That was a joke. But he changed his name from Abram to Abraham and he started the nation of Israel right there. All them people before, no, he's a Gentile, he's not a Jew. Where'd he go? Went to paradise. Sure he did. It gets good, man. Hey, now hold on a minute, preacher. I'll wet your whistle just a little bit. Now, I could talk about this till midnight, man. Acts chapter 2. They're all sitting there arguing about David, and they say, David's sepulcher is still with us, and well, why'd you say that? Well, maybe the Bible says in Matthew 27, when the Lord resurrected, many of, and, and many of them which slept arose. It didn't say all of them. So with that, we'll go ahead and close for the evening. Oh, it gets so good, man. Listen, man, God will be so good to you. Now, I'm going to ask you one favor. We're going to have a quick word of prayer here, but I'm going to ask you one favor. I, I know I've been a little long, but the, you can't just cut these things off. You have to finish a thought in order to, to finish it. Turn that tape off there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you one favor.